Hello and welcome to this um, almost final session of um, this year's uh, series of uh, digital materialities. Um, as people um, keep connecting, I'll um, shortly introduce um, Dr. Lauren Working. Um, so uh, uh, Dr. L Lauren Working is currently um, a lecturer in early modern literature um, at uh, York University uh, in the Interdisciplinary Center for Renaissance and Early Modern Studies. Um, her research focuses on 16th and 17th century, 17th century, oh, I'm good. <laughs> this is the end of the day, uh, end of the long down my end, uh, 17th century literary sociability, material culture and empire. Um, in 2020, um, she published a book called The Making of an Imperial Polity, Civility and America in the Jacobean Metropolis with Cambridge University Press, uh, which explores how colonial projects and the circulation of plantation goods uh, transformed ideas of civil refinement uh, in Jacobean London. Um, and uh, today's talk um, is going to be related to that. Um, she has published also articles on other topics, including intoxicants, wit poetry, female agents, and uh, Jamestown archaeology. Um, uh, she used to be uh, in Oxford for a while, and she has worked um, in with different museums, and uh, including um, with museum professionals and uh, uh, on archaeological sites, which um, is something I'm very interested in. Um, so I'm very happy to welcome um, Lauren tonight. Um, um, her talk is going to be about 25 minutes, 35 minutes. You're uh, really, it's, it's quite a flexible format, uh, but just make sure that we keep um, time for questions and answers at the end. Um, we all used to the format now, but, you know, uh, uh, please switch off your microphones. And then when it comes to the questions and answer, everybody's welcome, obviously, to unmute themselves and ask their question. Thank you very much. Um, great. Thank you so much. So I will share my screen. Um, it's yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming um, at the end of a long day um, and probably at the end of a, a very fruitful series already. Um, I will just open this to full screen. Um, is that, can everyone see that? Yes, perfect. Great. Okay, so um, in the late Elizabethan era, a drug first smoked by indigenous Americans and then produced by enslaved people and servants came to find a place in gentlemanly drinking culture. One could drink wine um, from a table fountain that, um, featured a drunken baby god, Bacchus, straddling a barrel held aloft by dolphins and carrying a crystal pineapple in his arms, while also celebrating, as the poet John Beaumont did in 1602, how the English would, um, quote, triumph over Virginia and the newfound land in the far countries where tobacco grows. It's this relationship between intoxication, literary sociability, um, and conquest that I'd like to explore today, particularly thinking also about objects, um, being really intrigued by um, the, the kind of series that you've been running on uh, material culture and literature. As scholars have established, tobacco became widely consumed across social groups in England. Um, by the 1630s, it had become a, a kind of intoxicant of mass consumption. Um, and was quickly becoming embedded alongside alcohol within social and political economies and rituals of belonging. The wide and escalating appeal of tobacco in England can, I think, make us lose sight of the particular ways in which tobacco came to be integrated within different social groups um, and why. So we see tobacco often as a domestic product, appearing in women's recipe books or in the city comedies of Ben Johnson and Thomas Decker, but we are less inclined to associate consumption with the indigenous people's practices and knowledge that made the presence of tobacco in Europe possible in the first place. Um, so in this talk, I want to use urban masculine sociability as a case study and explore this connection between colonialism and sociability by exploring the presence of Bacchus and tobacco 
in wit poetry and social performance in, in the kind of 1610s and 20s. Um, Kawasha was an Algonquin deity who became a personification of tobacco in several Jacobean texts and performances. The presence of Bacchus and Kawasha in early 17th century sociability can, I think, shed light on changing social practices in the immediate aftermath of colonialism, particularly following um, the establishment of Jamestown in 1607. Um, and also on the kinds of dialogues that different intoxicants and their associated ideas and behaviors brought together. Um, so often when I when I started working out, um, working on tobacco, lots of people were asking, um, well, people were drinking at the same time. I mean, often you see a tobacco pipe and a cup together at the same time. So what's the purpose of that? Um, why, why are these intoxicants being taken together in particular contexts? Um, so this is kind of my attempt to kind of think through some of those questions. Bacchus is a fitting figure to appear in tobacco poetry because he serves to connect an ostensibly foreign or new um, or what was often called a savage drug to the classical world of male friendship and urbane civility. But it's noteworthy too that Bacchus um, is celebrated as a conqueror. He's not just the god of wine and fertility, um, he's also a traveler who had himself been credited with setting out across um, the East Indies um, teaching local communities to cultivate vines. So his mythical journey to the Indus River involved military conquests. Um, and it struck me that the poetry that explores wine and tobacco together in the early Stuart era seemed to suggest that, that tobacco, as Bacchus's new muse, can exist quite comfortably in civil society by enhancing masculine refinement and celebrating gentlemanly project culture and imperial ambitions. Um, so as Michelle O'Callaghan explored in her book, The English Wits, the gentlemen who participated in convivial societies in London had complex rituals of association, played out in quasi-ceremonial spaces of interaction, such as private chambers and taverns. The men who met in spaces such as the Mermaid Tavern, um, often after a day in Parliament or at court, celebrated wine, wit, literary production, and good company um, through, as um, O'Callaghan put it, a knowledge of shared rituals and possession of shared cultural artifacts, such as poems and songs. He must drink wine, John Taylor wrote in 1614, that means to be a poet. Um, and I'm kind of struck by the fact that um, O'Callaghan talks about shared rituals and cultural artifacts in terms of um, songs and, and poems and kind of manuscripts being circulated, um, but also it does very much involve objects and it's that kind of material culture that I, I kind of wanted to tie in. Um, so references to Bacchus, the traveler and god of pleasure and misrule can be found in countless tapestries, goblets, ceramics, um, table knives, paintings, um, I have a very long list here because I, I went through a complete museum spiral um, researching this, but um, marble fireplaces, statues, I mean, lots of different kinds of decoration and tableware. Um, here's a, a few other examples that I came across um, in which we see the kind of um, god of misrule kind of engaging in um, his drunken kind of escapades. Um, tobacco, meanwhile, began appearing in English poetry from around the 1580s. The drug gradually became the subject of entire poems, ranging from short odes and satires to mock epic contributions, um, which I'll discuss in a bit, such as John Beaumont's 1602 Metamorphosis of Tobacco, or Raphael Thorius's Hymnus Tabaki, um, which was penned in the 1610s, and published first in Latin in the 1620s and then translated into English um, at least by 1651. Um, so in much tobacco poetry, Bacchus is never far away, which was something that always really struck me when reading these tobacco poems. Um, so one poem says, um, Bacchus steeps tobacco in his wine. Um, and lines like that one, you see that, that neat um, assonance that's happening between Bacchus and tobacco with their double C's. Um, it comes up, I think this is what Richard Brathwaite is referring to um, in his solemn jovial disputation of 1617, when he celebrates, as he says, a plant which to express his father shall still reserve the name of his progenitor, Bacchus, 
and therefore we have in his memory called him as one commended to the care, protection, and tuition of his father, tuition of his father, tobacco. Um, but the association is also there because gentlemen frequently smoked and drank together. All these are Bacchus's prentices, William Hornby complained of riotous London youth in 1618. At altars they tobacco sacrifice. Being thus assembled, Bacchus filled them until their wits were jolly, some to dance and leap about began, while Pluto sat smoking Nicotian. Um, kind of bad poetry there, but um, Nicotian being a reference to Jean Nico, um, the Frenchman credited with bringing tobacco um, to France. Um, so a number of the gentlemen who met at the Mermaid and other taverns were heavily involved with the Virginia Company. Um, so Walter Raleigh, for example, um, Richard Martin, who really pushed for um, the Virginia Company's place in parliamentary debate and procedure, and Sir Thomas Rowe. So my interest in investigating the poetry of these gentlemen wits is not just um, the, the kind of literary side, but also um, the, the politics and the sense of colonial expansion and what such literature um, helps tell us about empire and the interests of gentlemen who go on to have political careers. Um, so here is Kawasha or Kiwasha, um, an Algonquin deity. Kawasha appeared in Thomas Harriet's A Brief and True Report of the Newfoundland of Virginia um, in 1588, and, and the image is from 1590, where he was described as being an important spirit in the Algonquin mediation between earthly and spiritual realms. The people of this country have an idol, which they call Kiwasha. By the dead bodies in tombs, they set their idol Kiwasha, for they are persuaded that he doth keep dead bodies of their chief lords, and nothing may hurt them. Um, references to Kawasha as protector reappeared in several texts, including John Smith's um, History of Virginia and the geographer Samuel Purchase's Purchase as Pilgrims. He also becomes directly equated with tobacco in a court mask from 1614, the Mask of Flowers, um, which was produced by um, one of the Inns of Court, Gray's Inn, and likely at the behest of Francis Bacon, who was very involved with Gray's Inn. The stage directions describe two temples on opposite ends of the stage, one to Silenus, another to Kawasha. Kawasha enters, quote, born upon two Indian shoulders attired like for Luridians, um, while Silenus is an old man attired in a crimson satin doublet with a gray beard. Kawasha's appearance, um, uh, uh, this kind of youthful appearance coming um, to, to kind of wreak havoc on um, the personification of, of Bacchus as an elderly man is directly related um, to kind of wit culture and um, kind of the raucousness of um, kind of roaring boys of London at the time as well as to the Americas. So there are descriptions of Kawash's body and legs of olive color, in his hand, an Indian bow and arrows. Um, and the mask is presented as a competition between the personifications of wine and tobacco. We require you to understand that Silenus had lately sent a challenge to Kawasha that wine is more worthy than tobacco. Although Silenus is not explicitly depicted as a conqueror in the mask, I do see the dismissal of Algonquin belief systems as a declaration of colonial supremacy. Kawasha, who was known to appear in the spiritual spaces of the Algonquin Chesapeake as a guardian against the dead, has become equated with London's unruly roaring boys and the drinking cultures of the young metropolitan elite. Um, elsewhere, the elements of conquest are more evident. In John Beaumont's Metamorphosis of Tobacco and Raphael Thorius's Hymnus Tobacchi, Bacchus's association with tobacco points us to the kind of plantation intervention that gentlemen celebrated in their states of intoxication. Invoking Bacchus creates a connection between the old classical world of symposia and conviviality with new possibilities of colonial projection. Bacchus, Beaumont wrote, was patron of delight governed tigers with his princely might, conquered all the nations of the earth because he tamed their savage minds with mirth. 
Beaumont recast history as a slow projection um, towards a revelation of tobacco's divine properties, with tobacco becoming the reason for Bacchus's success. Um, so it's quite, I mean, the storyline of this poem is just completely ludicrous, but it's basically Bacchus and his band of merrymakers um, go to the Americas um, in order to teach indigenous peoples how to smoke tobacco and therefore become more civil. Um, and uh, so that's Raphael Thorius's poem. And Beaumont is also kind of recasting history um, in a way that that sees tobacco as, as presenting a moment of revelation. So the god um, Bacchus could not be a conqueror until great tobacco pleased to show her powers as now she doth in this blessed age of ours, blessed age where the Indian sun hath shined. So it's tobacco that fuels conquest, um, but tobacco doesn't reveal herself from nowhere. Instead, it's colonialism that allows the plant to become known so that the English, by spreading the colors of our English rose in far countries where tobacco grows, can tame the savage nations of the West. Um, and the humanist physician, Raphael Thoris's poem, makes that kind of connection even more explicit. So he says, thou shalt here see the invention of tobacco ascribed to Bacchus. Um, and it's a tale of conquest through civility. Um, so at one point he writes, um, Bacchus cheers them whom cannot Bacchus cheer. So tempered with a sweetness, he doth bear his awful majesty that they grow glad by such a band to be vanquished. The wine grows busy and betwixt each cup, they their pipe strike up. They do admire their native herb, but yet grieve they no longer, they no sooner knew the use of it. Um, so in contrast to Beaumont's nymph, tobacco in Thorius's poem is masculine. Tobacco king of plants, I well may call. In addition to tobacco becoming part of the means through which Bacchus, um, quote unquote, civilizes Native Americans um, by teaching them how to smoke their own resource, tobacco assists conquest. Um, it tempers the unfettered bacchanal that drunkenness might fuel, um, and in fact is kind of credited as restoring reason in some way. So who hath no sooner sacrificed unto his pettish memory a grain or two of the generous plant but he could straightways find all his lost figures in his scattered mind. His renegade words too, which were lately fled and hid in some dark corner of his head, he apprehendeth now as if a torch were lighted up in favor of his search and to the wandering people does dispense the ample treasures of his eloquence. So that ability to retain eloquence in the midst of conquest is a prime concern of English authorities in the unstable beginnings of their colonial expansion. The more I study this poem, the more it appears to be a direct riff of Bacchus's mythological conquest of India. Rather than Bacchus traveling across the East Indies, teaching people to plant vines, the poem is about Bacchus traveling to the West Indies, teaching Native Americans to smoke, quote, in civil fashion. Say muses how the Indians conquered were, book two begins. What trophies great god Bacchus raised there. How that fierce nation was with pleasing awe softened to the observation of the law. How we their bloody banquets changed and made of the destroying sword a saving spade. Rather than losing oneself in strange or unfamiliar contexts, there's a sense here of translatio imperi, of English civility moving gradually westward. Bacchus on closer inspection isn't just an empty trope, but rather a good poster boy for masculine conviviality because he's a traveler and a conqueror. He also brings prosperity, fertility, and agriculture, all the things that planters celebrate when they imagine English civility taking hold in the so-called wilderness. And the link to plantation and English trade is braided into the ending. For now thou hast an ample treasure got, which to the planter large revenue brings to the merchant's chests and custom house of kings. So although the poem seems fanciful, the material culture of the early colonies suggest that the cultural artifacts of elite sociability and wit culture 
um, songs, pipes, wine glasses are important to the colonial project. In the Golden Fleece printed in 1626, William Vaughan encouraged gentlemen to bring their rights as lords of the manor to land in America. So he writes, um, for what gentlemen of fashion will forsake their country unless they have a larger extent of command? Gentlemen in the 1610s and 20s were frequently um, kind of derided or attacked for bringing lace ruffs and painted dishes to Virginia and Bermuda and for expecting, um, as John Smith put it, stately houses, costly apparel, rich furniture, soft beds, dainty fare, dalliance and pleasures, feasts and banquets. There were many in Virginia merely projecting, Smith disdainfully recalled in 1612. Those witty spirits were so devoted to pure idleness that though they had lived for two or three years in Virginia, lordly, necessity itself could not compel them to leave the Palisades of Jamestown. While life on early plantations um, was not nearly as sumptuous as propaganda promised, gentlemen sought to pursue the lifestyles they enjoyed on estates back home. They hunted, smoked, drank alcohol from glass vessels, played dice games. Um, letters from Jamestown reported gentlemen's attempts to cultivate grapes um, and establish a glassmaking industry. It's one of the earliest industries attempted in Jamestown outside of um, tobacco and also to establish silk industries that would rival those, as um, colonial promoters put it, um, uh, those of China or Persia. Um, they also experimented with stamping tobacco pipes with the names of Virginia Company investors, including Walter Raleigh and Walter Cope, who was known for his large cabinet of curiosities in London, which um, the king and queen had visited. Um, and here's where kind of my interest in, in archaeology comes in a bit. But in the 1990s, archaeologists excavated the gentleman George Sands plantation, where he lived between 1621 and 1625. They unearthed um, French and Dutch stoneware, thousands of tobacco pipe fragments, velvet lined armor, English sixpence coins um, and dice. And only eight shards of indigenous pottery were found among the 67 recorded vessels. Um, so almost everything found on the site was actually manufactured in Europe. 96% of the site's tobacco pipe fragments are of European origins, largely London made. Um, and here's just a tiny, tiny fraction of pipes found on the sand site. Um, showing that most of them are actually made from white clay, so from the Dorset, uh, the pipe makers' um, monopoly on um, pipe making within the realm, um, rather than in local terracotta clay. So the pipe on the left is kind of made um, in, in a deliberate attempt to kind of mimic Algonquin style, but these seem to kind of be novelty pipes, and on the whole, gentlemen are smoking um, English manufactured pipes to smoke the tobacco that's coming from the Americas. Storage and serving vessels found on a number of sites um, are, so storage and serving vessels, sorry, are um, actually more common on some of these early sites of gentlemen um, than more practical vessels used to prepare food and drink, um, leading archaeologists to suggest that the inhabitants maintained a surplus and conspicuously displayed consumption, um, even within the first couple years of um, establishing a, a presence in the Chesapeake. So the cultural artifacts of elite sociability help us to reconstruct a sense of how transatlantic sociability developed, one that was very much enmeshed in early colonial projects. George Thorpe's 1624 inventory, um, it was drawn two years after his death because he died in the, um, the Indian uprising, as it's called, of 1622. Um, his inventory is the earliest surviving inventory of a gentleman's colonial estate. And it indicates how plantation sociability relied on the kind of gentlemanly goods found in London taverns and country houses. Thorpe had been a justice of peace and an MP, um, as well as a gentleman of the Privy Chamber at James's court. 
His inventory includes a velvet cloak, a silk suit, a nightcap, slippers, lace collars, a silver cup, um, and a mohair gown. His highest value goods were clothes, beds, rings, and um, silver gilt uh, utensils um, for the table. Letters by Thorpe to um, Thomas Smythe include several where he discusses his projects for growing fruit and also um, and, and kind of cultivating vines, as well as distilling a liquor made um, with indigenous maize. So he writes, we have found a good way to make so good a drink of Indian corn. Um, so what does all of this have to do with Bacchus and Kiwasha? Um, I'm increasingly interested in this connectedness between sociability in London and plantations. Gentlemen who had known each other at university or the inns of court and had traveled to Italy and even Constantinople now settled on plantations where they wrote poetry to each other, sent each other kind of verses um, and drank distilled liquor made of um, maize even as they also tried to kind of establish their own vineyards. Thinking about the literary sociability of wine and tobacco indicates how a reverence for European classicism entered into colonial self-fashioning. Civility, um, which is the very justification in many ways for English supremacy abroad, was performed on both sides of the Atlantic through drinking glasses um, and penning verses that celebrated colonialism in rooms filled with the smoke of a plantation sourced commodity. So conquest and civility uh, came together at the dinner table. The performative element of civility and the metropolitan literary world that gentlemen colonizers came from became significant for understanding how English plantation spaces were written about. As the English began to build, settle, plant, and fortify the Chesapeake in the 1620s and 30s, and definitely by the 1630s when we start getting um, larger kind of brick houses in Jamestown, the culture of politics, drink, and smoking fostered a shared sense of sociability um, across the Atlantic and made colonization not just a necessity, but a fashionable element of the civil gentleman. Letters and verses exchanged between colonists and Londoners evoked the shared world of the civil projector, one bolstered by intoxicants and the ideas of power expressed in the social lives they built around them. Um, and so then we get um, texts like Thomas Morton's um, very anti-Puritan celebration of cross-cultural revelry in New England, for example, where he combats what he sees as the austerity of the religious community of, of the Puritans around him by planning a bacchanal triumph. Um, so kind of, I, th I think this helps us kind of make sense of, of some of the texts that come at a slightly later point. Um, Another example would be the poetry of Robert Heyman in 1620s Newfoundland. Um, he publishes a whole book where he evokes his friendships at the inns of court and the way that um, his friends and the, the kind of sociability of the inns of court um, and his ongoing connection with them through his writing, even in Newfoundland, um, allows him to, to feel that he still has a, a sense of belonging um, even when he's away from that society that initially formed him. So um, servants in Jamestown, such as Richard Freethorne, wrote desperate letters home describing how with weeping tears they resorted to eating the bark of trees or mold off the ground. Um, and yet at this very same time, and this explains this discrepancy, I think, um, gentlemen are praising the fruit, hawks, venison, and other markers of abundance that the soil and wood would yield without your toil. Um, and I think for, for a long time, it's been kind of assumed that um, that that kind of discrepancy between the reality of what's happening kind of on the ground and kind of colonial propaganda was informed by gentlemen not actually being interested in Virginia and not really being interested in um, following colonial affairs. Whereas I think actually there's lots of evidence that they know very well what's happening kind of on the ground. Um, they're not ignoring it. They're kind of building a, a kind of literary um, aesthetic around um, 
colonial supremacy. Um, Planter's attempts to replicate alcohol-fueled sociability in plantations became a defining feature of elite colonial society and its links to estates in England um, far beyond this period, um, and helps us make sense of why George Thorpe, as a, a Middle Temple gentleman, as an MP, kept himself busy by attempting to cultivate grapes for wine and make kind of corn liquor. Um, and of course, wine and tobacco are intoxicants, um, and so in terms of thinking about colonialism and empire, I'm also kind of intrigued, um, what is it about these particular goods as intoxicants that kind of perhaps tells us something about the colonial project as well? Um, and that's kind of what I, I wanted to close with is just thinking about um, what intoxication in the context of colonialism and sociability can do in terms of bringing in an element of critique to the colonial project, um, where some writers used intoxication to comment on um, the, the corrupting effects or the ills of the colonial project. Um, so in critiques of mismanaged expansion, colonization was itself described as an act of intoxication, one that could poison the mind and one's capacity for virtue. I mean, I haven't come across a ton of examples of this yet, but um, it is an avenue that I'm kind of, um, moving towards a bit more. Um, one example is in the poet Joshua Sylvester's anti-tobacco tract from 1616, where he writes, um, they carried Bacchus, um, so speaking about the colonizers, they carried Bacchus and tobacco brought. Alas, poor Indians, this unfair exchange, um, as he put it, came when the English were led by cup god Bacchus. In his 1630 Unencouragement to Colonies, William Alexander, though not averse to colonial expansion, um, wrote of the greed that intoxicated the minds of conquerors and merchants. Um, he wrote, I wish that this might be our chance to begin a new life, leaving these dreams of honor and profit, which do intoxicate the brains and empoison the mind with transitory pleasures. Um, I'm jumping quite ahead here, and I'm sure I will be able to find examples that, that kind of happen um, in the 50 years in between. But I, I just wanted to end on a, a later 17th century example where we get a sense of intoxication as a form of willful amnesia. So in 1684, Thomas Tryon, in his friendly advice to the gentlemen planters, suggested that gentlemen in Jamaica drank to forget the horrors of plantation brutality that they themselves perpetuated. In Tryon's fictional dialogue between an enslaved African and his white master, the African man laments, oh, you brave and swaggering Christians who exercise this strange and severe mastership over us, who sport yourselves in all manner of wantonness and grow fat with our blood gormandizing with the fruits procured by our slavery. You are sat by your rum pots, your punch bowls, your brandy bottles, and the rest of your intoxicating enchantments. And there's a lot about the evils of drink in the text, which become conflated with immorality and the abuse of enslaved black and indigenous people. Um, that's not to say that Tryon views a world in which African and indigenous people are free, um, they're only better treated. Um, but the function of drink in his argument is to equate intoxication with an, an abuse of power. Um, so moving forward, I'd like to think a bit more about um, forms of intoxication. Um, on one hand, its social role in fostering transatlantic friendships, um, kind of governing or guiding various social interactions, um, perhaps the way it might have put pressure um, or, or kind of invited gentlemen um, to become more involved in colonial projects, um, but also its associations with dispossession and brutality and the way this becomes built into civil refinement. 
Wit sociability is often related to masculine conviviality and the way, um, as Anya Taylor wrote in Bacchus in Romantic England, that the drinker sees a multiplied and transformed being released from previous roles free to explore alternative selves. These alternative selves were, in Jacobean poems that followed Bacchus on his conquests, ways of helping gentlemen imagine their own place in the colonial project. It allowed them to express fantasies of civil refinement in which blood and resistance did not enter in. Material culture was integral to how such intoxication was moderated, expressed, and indeed permitted. Bacchus and the rituals around conviviality made civility and conquest compatible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you, that was fantastic. So um, I'm gonna start with a question. <laughs> I just wanted to um, have more of your thoughts on the um, interesting gendering of um, the tobacco, uh, you know, sometimes uh, male, sometimes female, in mm -hmm. relation in relation to the the kind of so called civilizing um, process in which it is supposed to be integrated. Um, did that have anything to do with it? The the uh, kind of imagining tobacco to be female or male as a kind of polishing element to masculine interaction? Oh, thanks. That's a great question. Yeah, I, and I knew as I was saying it, I was like, oh, there's probably so much more to bring out of this um, element. Um, I, off the top of my head, I'm thinking that um, it might be significant that Beaumont is writing towards the end of the Elizabethan era and at a time when um, gentlemen are often referring to America itself as female and kind of coded even sometimes as a nymph. Um, and so I wonder if there's a kind of sense in which mascu the masculinity of tobacco that comes perhaps a little bit later and definitely by the 1620s and 30s and kind of the reign of Charles um, is perhaps a, a shift in, in thinking about empire a bit more on masculine terms rather than that kind of late Elizabethan kind of virgin soil um, kind of topos that gets used a lot in wit culture. Um, I'd want to kind of think about the gendering a bit more, but I would want to revisit some poems about tobacco to do so, I think. Thank you. Um, and yes? Yes. Hello. Hello, Lauren. Uh, thank you so much. I loved your book and uh, your art. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Lovely to uh, to uh, rehear some of these arguments slightly uh, with different sources this time. I have to I have two questions for you. Um, the first one is is a general question about who these gentlemen are, because you mentioned Smith's criticism of them for their mm -hmm. idleness and their failure to comply with the bare necessities of colonial labor. So of course we know that he wanted to make himself sound as the best colonizer that ever was, but was he a gentleman? I mean, he wrote extensively afterwards. Um, some of the engravings that you showed certainly, uh, you know, reminded us of his, uh, the way he presented himself after he returned uh, to London. So my first question is, how does this literary production that you mobilize relate to official Virginia company promotion? Uh, were you able to identify among those poets so a gentleman who was paid by the company to write or to perform? Mm -hmm. And the second question um, was uh, regarding the argument that you mentioned by an archeologist I don't think you named, uh, who argued that uh, there was a delib deliberate display of consumption from the get-go by gentlemen in Jamestown. And I was wondering why civility was performed that way over there. Is it a part of the, um, a, uh, a survival mechanism maybe? <laughs> Is it part of a strategy towards 
um, negotiating with Native Americans for the food that they desperately need. Uh, so two types of arguments. Do, are these sources part of the general campaign of the Virginia Company in the 1610s? Mm -hmm. And the second argument is why is it why do they display so much wealth when they're starving? Is my second. Yeah, point. it's yeah. I mean, it it does go really to the heart of what I've been struggling with to trying to understand. Is yeah that that interaction between what's happening and what's being imagined and how much knowledge people have about those colonial conditions. Um, to go to your first question, so I think what's what's really um, striking to me about this time period is that so many gentlemen, be that members of the gentry, but also of the aristocracy, are so keen to get involved and not just get involved as patrons, but actually go. Um, you know, they're they're not just kind of sending servants or kind of members of the household to go in their stead. Um, and that was kind of a big departure point for the, the research of my book was just what is impelling gentlemen to go on these risky journeys in the first place? Um, and because this is before mass migration and it's a relatively small number of people going, um, what is the significance of the fact that a lot of the gentlemen who go are also just really intimately tied with um, political affairs within the realm? Um, so why is colonization becoming so affixed to kind of political participation? Um, is the in terms of Virginia Company makeup, I mean, there's it's a broad spectrum of individuals, largely male. There's a couple female investors, um, although even then. It, it's possible that they invested money kind of for other family members who were male. So it gets a bit complicated, um, but there are many members of, of the kind of um, gentry and kind of middling class of um, merchants, but a lot of the governing body is still um, kind of very high ranking aristocrats. Um, and what's interesting about that in terms of kind of relating to um, a little bit of your Second question, too, is that, um, yeah, and going back to what I said, it it kind of means that those in charge of the company are often those that wouldn't have to go if they didn't really want to. Um, and the you bringing in Smith is a really good example. I think the visuals of Smith, um, as you rightly say, and in a lot of his portraits of the time, um, and it's something I kind of looked at on a side project, um, looking at roughs in Jamestown. So archaeologists have also found um, five goffering irons, so the tools used to kind of crimp roughs into shape. That might kind of help unlock your second question about civility, but um, I'm almost really struck that even though John Smith is actually kind of, John Smith dismisses aristocrats, but aristocrats also dismiss Smith a lot, um, even though they're really reliant on his knowledge. And as you say, he is educated enough that he is producing maps and writing accounts. Um, but they are very disdainful and there's definitely a kind of difference in degrees of um, how they view Smith and indeed a lot of Virginia Company writers um, who are involved with the deliberate propaganda are kind of outside those aristocratic circles. Um, so I do think it's telling and why I kind of wanted to look at kind of print but also manuscript sources of, of gentlemen's writings because it's the literature of gentlemen who don't really need to, or perhaps don't believe the propaganda because they have kind of insider knowledge um, and yet they're still going. And I think the answer is just land at the end of the day, they just want land. Um, but the, the element of civility is very important and I'm not sure quite which way it flows. Like, I don't know if sometimes they, in some of their early writings do acknowledge a bit the civility of indigenous peoples because it's something that they themselves are so obsessed with. Um, I'm really struck in George Percy's account um, of Virginia that I think it's because he's so obsessed with clothes and he loves clothes so much that he writes about Algonquin styles really eloquently. And I really do think it comes down to his keen eye for kind of thinking about kind of texture and adornment because he writes um, really lovely descriptions of Algonquin kind of adornment, um, clothing, styles, um, hairstyles, things like that. Um, so I think there is an element of appreciation. And at the same time, that is often 
necessarily subsumed under the very justification of colonization, which is basically the idea that indigenous peoples are, are kind of savage and therefore need to be converted in various senses of the word. Um, the narratives hit a limit. There's a point yeah. where they hit a limit and they revert to imagined cannibalism or sacrifices or yeah. there's often a drop, you know, in the description. But yeah. if I if I may suggest just, you know, from having read a, a lot of promotional material around mm. the period, it seems to me that this particular generation going to Virginia in the 1610s is in transition. It's kind of an you know, you will. You mentioned William Alexander, who has experience of having tried, and then he comes back and he says, "Well, you need a proportion of labor to gentlemen that is sevenfold." So, if unless you have provisions for two years and enough hands to cultivate, I mean, it, you know, it becomes very managerial after that decade. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And during that decade, it seems that they're going hit and miss a bit. You know, the yeah. company hires soldiers to manage a plantation, which is already a mistake. And they, you know, they, it's a sum of mistakes. And it seems to me that that's what Smith points to every time. He's yeah. given it more thought than most people. And it's um, it's something that came out in spending time at the Jamestown archaeological site, as well as I remember initially going and having ideas about the period I'm looking at, you know, kind of thinking in terms of, the early 1610s all the way to the late 1620s um and the archaeologists were immediately like yes but which rubbish bin are you talking about because some of these goods you know there's if you look at this bin or you know like this this kind of trash heap that they had in the early 1610s it's full of military gear um military sashes kind of much more um in some ways quite old-fashioned armor, like a sense that the monarch was just kind of sending off just whatever he had lying around, you know, to kind of um, provide provisions. And you kind of wonder how serious the colonial project is to kind of the elite. Um, and then as time progresses, um, the, the bins start having, you know, kind of signals of all these other elements of, of sociability, of different kinds of clothing, of women's clothing, of indigenous beads, um, and that kind of thing. So I do think archaeology really does also offer a very important clue for how we read all this, this kind of propaganda literature, as you say, um, and, and giving very specific um, kind of moments enough attention rather than, um, you know, drawing generalizations over several decades. So yeah, you're absolutely right about looking at the, the transitional phase. You said it was propaganda, but then there's knowledge in there. There's mm -hmm. knowledge from experience that builds up and that gets shared and then built upon again. So I think it's valuable material personally, but I don't want to monopolize the session. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, yeah, gosh. absolutely. Yep. Thank you very much. I'm not sure I can see everybody. Um, I'm trying to change my. So, Benedict? Hello, and, and thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Um, I was very interested by the way you talked to us about the, the, the gender differences between the tobacco and the alcohol. I wanted to know if you had a bit, if you could tell us a bit more about the class differences, especially for the alcohols. Um, you've explained to us how um, the alcohol showed the relationship with the empire and this. Um, you ended with those, you know, testimonies that showed that alcohol consumption somehow was linked with pro-slavery and and um empire can you can you tell us if specific alcohols had more or less of this empire structure and if they corresponded to different classes i know you you mentioned poor you mentioned punch balls for example yes um so i mean i'm oh, i wish i had the image and i and i don't which is annoying but there there's a fairly well known um image from a printed book um, from the early or from 1617 where there are gentlemen kind of drinking and smoking um, at the top of the image around kind of table in a tavern setting 
Um, and then underneath there's um, kind of, you know, the, the poorer sorts as they would have referred to them as um, kind of in an inn and kind of all dancing like jigs. Um, and, and I kind of, and, and they're playing the pipes and I kind of, and there, there's a, there's, there's a sense in the text that there's a little bit of a play on pipes, you know, and the kind of pipe playing mm -hmm. of, um, you know, the, the kind of lower classes and then the refinement of kind of access to tobacco pipes that the, the kind of elite would have, um, they, there's often kind of dialogues around, the superiority of wine over beer and beer is often kind of um, like a country gentleman or um, a kind of um, often kind of obese um, kind of simple man or or something like that. So I think that there, are, there is a kind of distinction between those who have access to um, various imported wines, especially and kind of sack verse uh, because you would have to have different uh, um, spices and, and sugar and things to be able to enjoy sack versus um beer and ale which had kind of long been staples of um english pubs basically or inns um the the kind of i think the global nature of intoxicants after tobacco does kind of complicate things a bit and even in this period it's a bit more complicated than that in that often it's sailors you know who, who have the knowledge of travel and global goods and who are bringing them back into the realm so punch for example even though it was largely enjoyed um, by the elite in England and there's a whole kind of material culture world we could talk about in terms of um nutmeg graters made out of Caribbean sourced shells and and kind of um how intoxicants are kind of consumed um but punch comes from um the East India company kind of importing um an Indian kind of recipe into the realm so I think there's a tendency to kind of think about various um, class differences in in alcohol and in intoxicants, but that there's always kind of a knowledge coming from um, those who are traveling and those who might not have left written records behind who also would have consumed these goods. They just weren't able to kind of codify them in a way that we can study as easily. Um, and of course, the knowledge of peoples from the other parts of the world in producing those goods um, is often obscured as well. So my interest is largely in um, indigenous cultures, but it's it's kind of happening through um, under novelties, I think, for, you know, just from most intoxicants and, and most goods that are coming into the realm. Um, and the intoxicants project and the intoxication, um, cultures of intoxication project, I think has done a little bit of work around court records um, that can probably help us understand that a bit more as well. Thank you very much. I had a, another question, if I may, um, and that was about um, the objects and whether um, um, there was anything or you had anything to say about um, the, the kind of the the role of the objects um, as uh, instruments in the kind of polishing, civilizing, um, you know, project that, you know, bringing, whether basically bringing this European material culture uh, mm -hmm. in, um, and in a way they're all containers, aren't they? So they contain, the tobacco that contained the intoxicants, the, the, the drink. Um, is there anything to say about um, the, the kind of agency of the object in, in, in fathering the, the, the containment project of, of civilizing, bringing civility or supposed civility um, to, to these wide nations? Yeah, that's so fascinating. I mean, yeah. So the, the short answer is yes. Um, the long answer is I don't know how, it's, sometimes it's frustrating working with material culture and just thinking like, 
actually some so much of the object these objects are actually so unknowable i mean even if we you know sometimes they don't even exist anymore because the references and text and sometimes we do still have examples of the object but they change so much when they change hands and so even tobacco pipes european tobacco pipes for example um did indigenous or african people in jamestown just use them and smoke them in the same way or you know did, were, did they have their own kind of responses to the object that may have allowed them to find a way of, of kind of resisting the colonial project in some way I mean it's very very difficult to know um there's Lots of evidence in writings such as accounts of Francis Drake's voyages, where he specifically says that he wants silver tableware to be brought with him on his journey. Um, and there is a sense in which he believes that kind of bringing these so-called kind of civilizing objects um, as he travels across the Indies um, are going to play an important role in kind of diplomacy and in kind of encouraging civility in others. Um, and also actually quite a lot of accounts in the early 17th century, um, late Elizabethan as well, um, Thomas Harriet, but also Richard Hacklett's accounts, um, view English wool and English fabrics as objects that will force dependency on indigenous people. So it's a bit like, oh, we'll, we'll tantalize them with objects, even though they're not very consumerist and object oriented. And by making them consumers will make them reliant on us. So on one hand, I think objects are very important to the kind of civilizing project of the English in all kinds of ways um, in the roughs that they bring with them, even though it's completely impractical to where anyone who's been to Virginia and felt the humidity there. I mean, imagining life with a rough sounds um, impossible um, all the way through to thinking about how a reliance on English manufacture in plantation spaces would kind of um, force indigenous peoples to, in some ways, become more civil like the English. Um, but I think there's there has been a little bit of work done um, about how indigenous valuations of copper pots, for example, that the English bring are quite, um, you know, are very different to what the English trade them for. Um, and that even kind of metals that the English give um, made out of kind of, they're meant to be made out of silver. They're often made out of cheaper metals um, because the English are just cheap and don't want to spend that kind of money on, on ostensibly kind of commemorative or um, diplomatic medals. But the medals they give to indigenous leaders kind of wear to show their allegiance to the monarch. Um, I also suspect that indigenous peoples actually wore in kind of very different ways than they were intended. Um, I've done a little bit of looking into Victorian accounts of oral histories of indigenous peoples that exist from um, referring back to the early modern period um, or stories that have had kind of continued over the centuries um, into the 19th and 20th centuries in which tobacco pipes kind of spring uh, gifted pipes from the English that um, indigenous peoples put in graves kind of spring back to life and kind of take revenge on people. Um, and in that sense, objects have very active agency. Thank you very much. And yes, you wanted to say something. I, I saw you react at one point. Yes. No, I was I was thinking of uh, copper pots that are cut out and uh, re redefined entirely into new objects. And it's what's so fascinating is this um, perception that the English have from the beginning, or Europeans even, that they have the upper hand in the exchange because they know the real value of things, and they completely miss the idea that things might have a different value and a value in its own terms. And I'm thinking of the beads and uh, you, there were lots of beads on the on the uh, uh, watercolor that you showed um, of Q it's, it's, it's um, the English use the word trifle remarkably abundantly to signify that they are the civilized ones because they know what the value of these objects are. But 
in indigenous hands, they acquire a completely different value and, uh, and therefore become as valuable and uh, just show a misunderstanding. Um, and the English, you know, appropriate considerable amounts of objects from indigenous culture as well, because they, you know, a lot of their navigation tools are not suitable. They're closing, um, you know, it's-, it's Canoes. Just, uh, hmm? Sorry, Canoes. Uh, yes, yeah. exactly. So David Silverman's book on the, on the, uh, the saltwater people is that is ab absolutely wonderful in that respect because he's uncovered uh, a form of occupation and exploitation of the land that that the English absolutely did not mention. Did they miss it? I mean, they can't have missed, you know, canoes full of forty warriors, um, yeah. things that size and that shape. So I often, you know, I still wonder what. what wonder it's it's another strategy there's a lot of strategies to construct a representation of how that space functions and how each object fits in there and the first misconception is that of gender roles and gender labor and the importance of female labor and no it's it's really fascinating. yeah and and you talking about value reminds me that um this isn't an indigenous context um but when english merchants write about Madagascar, you know, by the 1620s and 30s, they, they say the same thing. They say, um, you know, we would view Cornelian beads as not very valuable. However, we will literally starve to death if we don't give them the beads that they want. They don't want, um, you know, black ones. They don't want, you know, yellow ones. We need to give them the beads that they value in order to access food. Um, so, they have to acknowledge as well that their systems of value um, will come up short and will actually um, potentially hinder the colonial project if they they refuse to acknowledge. The There's of... something to do about the beads. I think first how they are sourced, how much the company, where in England are they made? Is it the same people? Does it become a market? Mm -hmm. Does it become a market throughout the period? Does it? Who does it enrich? Who? How, how is that knowledge uh, spread? Um, yeah. I mean, in New England, it's mostly wampum, so, but glass beads also. Mm -hmm. And in later periods, glass beads remain extremely important. Yeah, and that it would be important work to do because there are examples of some of this, this bead work and of wampum belts and everything, um, you know, collections in France and in England um, that are just kind of um, sitting there and haven't really been confronted or really viewed as these kind of urgent um kind of vibrant objects in in their own right well thank you very much with uh, this call for attention of beads <laughs> um maybe we can end the session and uh, before we end i would like us to thank again um lauren for a wonderful paper um i'll